I happen to have to have heard uh, uh, Charlie do a presentation on his book up in Greenfield a few years ago when the book came out uh, at the uh, Return of the Book Store up there. And quite frankly, I think it had just been uh, put in place at that uh, bookstore. And I was quite pleased uh, to get a sort of book series that they had in back then. It all worked out he happened to be coming through the, the uh, study. Uh, I, like others, are uh, very excited. Uh, as you know, in this country, uh, we are celebrating 50 years around a lot of things. Um, this year and uh, next year, I'm sure you've heard, we've seen and read all of the uh, pieces on the war and the war economy. Uh, 50 year anniversary of that. Um, and one of, one of the things I, I, I always like as a scholar reading back through some of those. Uh, those uh, documents and the literature is that uh, initially, uh, in that process, uh, one of the aspects of the war I've had to do with model cities. And some of you who were, who was, who was as young as I am would remember that. But one of the things I always found quite interesting uh, was that they initially was not going to call it model cities, it was going to call it demonstration cities. And then uh, someone in the Johnson administration decided that, that would not be right, that seemed to be in keeping with the fact that there were demonstrations going on and indeed demonstrations that had brought about uh, and forced the, the national government to, in fact, move in some, in some very um, important ways around the question of poverty and uh, dispossession of the, the uh, life. Uh, also, I will be able to note that, um, uh, of course, this is the, the, the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, and we will be celebrating the Freedom uh, Summer here in Jackson. And I got a call that we from the home girl lines who have already talked to uh, Dave Dennis. They organize the efforts there as well. Um, and so in so many ways, this is an opportunity for, uh, for those persons who were actually there, actually involved, to get together and see each other in old home, we can be real, but also to reminisce. But it is, it is an opportunity for all of us to uh, uh, sort of reflect as well as uh, think about how we can can use what what the civil rights movement did to uh, deal with the questions and problems that we are uh, confronting in the 21st century. And so, this discussion to, tonight, I think, is, is going to be very, very important in that context uh, because what what the other has done is to um, go around the country and to identify uh, those places and sites uh, on the civil rights trail. Uh, that are so important for um, generations uh, that came after the movement and generations that will come to in fact know about and to get the opportunity to uh, visit. And finally, I'll say that this is important for me personally because I have spent um, a good part of my career, uh, especially when I was in South Carolina working in historic preservation. Um, and uh, was a, a, a state, state commission on the archive History Commission and, and along with others push forward uh, regular attention on, um, on identifying uh, the sites that were important to uh, uh, black people uh, in that uh, state. Uh, and South Carolina has a very interesting and very rich history around all of these questions. Um, and so by the time that we came along uh, involved in historic, in historic preservation in the 1980s and 90s, uh, they have pretty much put all of the plantations and arcs and cemeteries on the uh, registry, uh, but there were none on there that, that, that mattered to uh, black people. So we put together, a group of us did, the South Carolina African American Heritage uh, Council uh, that led the way in identifying the sites that are now marked. Um, and we also did a great uh, job of trying to uh, identify those uh, structures that needed to, to be rehabbed and made the effort to get uh, money to them, a lot of money public monies for rehab and so forth, a lot of monies that have come out of the Public Records Act. And I know in Mississippi, of course, we are in, in the process of seeing the, the Civil Rights, Rights Museum go up, and hopefully when, when that happens, um, there will be some other things done uh, to accent what, what, what that, that museum is going to uh, do, not only as a, as a repository, but also as a place in which people can come and learn, teach and learn and so forth. So there are a lot of aspects to, to uh, this. And so in this, 50th, in this year 
of celebrating 50 years, um, we come to, uh, to have a conversation with uh, Charles Cobb. Um, Charles Cobb is a, is a distinguished journalist and a former member of the National Geo Geographic Magazine, editorial staff. He's currently a senior writer and diplomatic correspondent for AllAfrica.com, the leading online provider of news from from and about Africa. And uh, Charles will be telling me he, he has been in and around Africa for a long time uh, and was part of the, if I'm correct, Charles, was part of the delegation of SNCC folk who uh, went to Africa and began to lay some foundation um, uh, that was so important to uh, establishing solidarity with the African continent, especially the national liberation struggles that were going on uh, during that at a time. His uh, latest book here that we want to, to, uh, to have some conversation on is On the Road to Freedom, a guided tour of the Civil Rights Trail. Um, on July 24th, uh, uh, 08, the National Association of Black Journalists honored Carl's work by inducting him, him into their Hall of Fame. So without further ado, I give you Charlie Carl.
But the boycott was so successful that what was raised was the idea of continuing the boycott until the city gave in and desegregated the buses. And they had a meeting to discuss this, the same day as that one-day boycott in Martin Luther King's church, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. It was full of, uh, the meeting was full of Montgomery's uh, uh, black leadership establishment, its preachers and the like. And mostly, according to Johnny Carr, they were scared. And they were coming up with one reason after the other why one day was enough for the boycott and maybe now they had a chance to talk to the city officials and might make some progress on bus segregation. And the discussion was going back and forth like that and not getting forward uh, in, in any particular way. So finally, uh, the real leader of Montgomery's black community, a man named E.D. Nixon, stood up. E.D. Nixon was a Pullman porter. He was a member of A. Philip Randolph's Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the largest black union in the United States. He looked across at this audience, largely composed of ministers, and said, according to Ms. Carr, uh, you preachers been eating these women's fried chicken long enough. Now it's time to get up off your behind and do something for them. Because it's the women who were mostly affected by this bus segregation because they were the ones traveling from one side of town to the other side of town. They were the maids and the cooks and the like. And, and Edie Nixon went on to accuse them of being cowards for not wanting to extend this boycott. And it was at this point that Martin Luther King, then just 26 years old, stood up, looked at E.D. Nixon and said, I am not a coward. And that kind of broke the ice and they were able to, the ministers now thoroughly embarrassed, uh, <laughs> agreed to the formation of what we now know of as the Montgomery Improvement Association. And they elected this very young new minister in town, Martin Luther King, as president of this newly formed organization. So what you see in this story is the kind of challenges that existed right through the black community. That's how I wound up in Mississippi. Leslie Lawrence Giat stood up and challenged me. He said, you say you're going to Texas for a civil rights workshop? What's the point of doing that when you're standing right here in Mississippi? And that was in 1962, and I never did get to that workshop in Texas. <laughs> I wound up in the Delta. And so, so these challenges, you know, repeat any movement you look at in the South, uh, certainly in the 1960s, you see some kind of challenge like that. So that's my first point, elaborated on much more lengthily than I had originally intended. Second point to understand uh, in our discussion about the movement is uh, that what you see when you look at it, and Mississippi is a very clear example of this, a convergence of young people with older people who are willing to turn over the networks that they had built up over decades, in many instances, before any of us were born. They had been out there. This is Amzie Moore in Cleveland, Mississippi. This is E.W. Steptoe down there in Southwest Mississippi is Anzie Moore up there, I'm sorry, Aaron Henry up there in Clarksdale, Mississippi, or Hartman Turnbull in Holmes County, uh, Mississippi. And I could go on and on. These people, maybe Anzie was the youngest of these people. He was 49 years old when we met him. I was 19 years old when I met him. So these older people willing to take us in and basically keep us alive because we didn't know anything. Uh, and, and turn over a network, which meant we could move across the state and around the state on networks that they had built up. And again, that story is repeated in every center of movement activity in the South, from Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana. Uh, you, you know, it's, you really see it in Louisiana with how the core workers and the deacons for defense and justice integrated uh, one another's efforts in, in Louisiana. And, and my brother-in-law worked for CORE in, in Louisiana, in Jonesboro, where the deacons were originated. And I asked him once, I said, uh, what do you think about these guys, these deacons? 
his first response, he said, these were old people, Charlie. <laughs> they were people like our parents, grandparents, and they were old people. So, so again, you see, you know, kind of this converted. So that's important to understand if you want to understand the Southern movement. And the last, and maybe the most important thing to understand, and again, what I often write about, is that people who are usually spoken for by other people, sometimes sympathetically, sometimes with hostility, but people who were usually spoken for by other people found their own voices and began to speak for themselves in ways in which they cannot, could not be ignored. This is Fannie Lou Hamer's story. This is Annie Devine's story in Canton, Mississippi. It's Vicki Gray's story in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. These people found their own voices and began to speak out saying, this is what we want. In fact, they began to say, this is what we demand ways in which they cannot be ignored. So it, and that's an important difference because it meant little for Charlie Cobb from Washington, D.C. to be in Mississippi saying that he thought black people were dissatisfied or unhappy or wanted this or that. That's some guy from Washington, D.C., some young guy who doesn't know very much. It, but when Mrs. Hamer says, I'm sick and tired, being sick and tired. That's a whole different story. That's not Charlie Cobb speaking. It's not even Charlie Cobb speaking for Mrs. Hamer. That's Mrs. Hamer speaking for herself. And again, when you look across the South, um, this is what you see if you're looking at the Southern Freedom Movement. All these people who had been invisible, certainly for most of the 20th century, because I'm not talking about Roy Wilkins and the you know, I'm not talking about James Farmer of the Congress of Racial Equality or, or any of the other leaders who existed in the upper ranks of, of black leadership. I'm talking about C.C. Bryant and McComb who had a barbershop underneath his big tree in his front yard and had a little bookshelf where you could read Ebony and Jet. Carter G. Woodson and, and, and people like these people, invisible, until they began to raise their voices. And when they did raise their voices, they couldn't be ignored. You, you know, there's no way you're going to ignore Mrs. Hamer when she gets on or something. Uh, uh, and that's an important aspect of, of black life that shaped Southern Trump. And, and in raising these voices, in the South, these people changed the whole country. You know, you wouldn't have Barack Obama as president without the expansion of the role of women and minorities in the Democratic Party. And you would not have that expansion of the role of, of women and minorities in the Democratic Party without the challenge by the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was organized in Mississippi in 1963 and 1960. So, so in raising their voices, uh, Mrs. Hamer is changing more than Sunflower County, Mississippi. Or in raising his voice, E.W. Steptoe is changing more than Amit County, Mississippi. Or C.C. Bryant is changing more, you know, than Macomb, Mississippi, and Aaron Henry, and Andy Moore. These people could not be ignored, and they broke down this whole system had been grinding people down for a couple hundred years. It's actually quite amazing that you had enough people to really give it all the habits that white supremacy had instilled in black people and planted in uh, black life. Now, most of this history is ignored. <laughs> I have a huge problem with how the history of, of the movement uh, is, is presented, uh, it's top down, it is oriented towards iconic moments, and iconic figures, uh, and we don't see uh, anything, uh, you know, at the grassroots. 
that's what got me into writing about the movie. You know, I was for, I've been a journalist all my working life since I left Mississippi. And all my journalism has been in foreign affairs. I was a State Department correspondent for NPR back in the day. I did foreign films for Frontline. I was a staff writer bouncing all around the world uh, for National Geographic uh, magazine. All my background as a journalist has been in foreign affairs. I never covered the Congress. I never covered the White House. I never even did local politics. I did the State Department. I did the Pentagon, you know. And I did a couple of wars. Uh, but what changed my mind, and in Mississippi seems to be constantly changing my mind, was, <laughs> was Mississippi. And what happened was this. <laughs> Mayor Evers' old neighborhood is not that far from this particular building. And in Mayor's neighborhood, there's a middle school, Brinkley Middle School. And I had written a book with Bob Moses about his education work. And a lot of it was in Mississippi. So I had gone back to Brinkley Middle School where the principal had given me a lot of help to bring her a book. And I knew a lot of the <coughs> students there. So uh, I was sitting, I wasn't driving uh, my own car. Was, uh, after I chatted with the principal, I was sitting on the steps of the school with, with a bunch of middle school kids, all 10, 12 of them. And the middle school is directly across the street from the Fannie Lou Hamer Public Library. So I decided to go into what I only half jokingly call old guy mode. And uh, I decided to engage these kids in a discussion about Megger and Fannie Lou Hamer. And I asked them first if they could tell me something and tell students who didn't know anything, something about men, and nobody knew anything. Until finally one kid stood up and said, well, didn't he get killed? And that's what he knew about Megger, that he had been killed. So I shifted gears and I pointed at the library and I said, well, how about this lady, Fanny Lou Hamer? What can you tell me about her? Well, they didn't know anything about uh, Mrs. Hamer. So, so I said, uh, well, you need to know about her. She's really important to Mississippi. You need to, uh, and I said, I knew her, and I'll be back in a few days. And I said, I'll be back in a few days, and I knew Mrs. Hamer. So if you want, I can tell you some things about her. And I was getting ready to tell them what I thought would be a, a Fannie Lou Hamer story that would get everyone back on the steps breathlessly waiting for me. But when I said I knew her, one of these kids leapt to his feet and stared at me in total amazement. He was maybe 13 years old. I was in middle school. He looked at me in total amazement. And I remember it exactly. And he says, Mr. Cobb, you was alive back then. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I, I sort of resisted some wise crack, like, yeah, me and Fred Douglas, and Mr. Turner Drew, Harriet Tubman, we all hung out. I went to the bar with them. I resisted all that. And, but it, it stayed with me. I realized, you know, for these kids, 13, 14 years old, middle school kids, 12, I mean, I'm talking ancient times, you know, it's all lumped together. Runaway slaves and sneak. Uh, you know, you know, uh, it's all just back there. And, and, and this is a large problem. I mean, this is a problem in part with the schools. This is a part, a problem with our own failures as movement people, not to pass on the story. This problem of parents who were alive in the 1960s pass on the story. So it occurred to me that, well, maybe, Charlie, you should start writing about this. You know, because you know the story, or at least substantial parts of the story, and, and you can do that. And I did. I, I, that's what set me on the course for writing about, 
literally dropping my work as a foreign affairs reporter because I never did get I had left the geographic to do the book with Bob Moses and I intended to go back. But aside from liking the fact that I wasn't working for anybody, uh, it, it seemed to me that if I went back, I would never get to the telling of this story. And, uh, and thus, that's what this book emerged out of that. And, I, I, and, and as much as this is a travel book for people who want to drive around the South and see civil rights sites, nowhere to go with their automobiles and know some of the backstory. The book is also designed to appeal to younger people. That's why there's a lot of photographs uh, in this particular book. Because I think young people need to see pictures. And it's why the book has a lot of what are called sidebars, which are essentially my interviews, and I just excerpt excerpt the best parts of the interviews, meaning here uh, the best stories from the interview. There's a distinction between stories and scholarship. You know, I, I was looking because I wanted the book to hold the attention of young people. While I certainly wanted to be accurate, I wasn't attempting to do scholarship in the way it's done at the academy. You know, I was looking for stories. You know, what story, if you're 15 or 16 years old, do you want to read? How did Hollis Watkins become involved in the movement? How did Curtis Hayes become involved in the movement? How did, what was on Stokely Carmichael's mind? So it's story driven, and story driven because I think if there's any, the greatest task in terms of doing movement history is figuring out how to do it in a way that works for young people. And I'm not so much thinking of college students as I'm thinking of high school students and middle school students. And since I'm not on anybody's tenure track, and since, you know, I do not have to please anybody in terms of academic presentation, I can allow myself to be story driven. And this is an old problem. I want The other thing I wanted to do, and it's what I try and do, aside from the problem of young people and what they understand or don't understand, there's also, if you read civil rights books, although this is changing, it's been changing in recent years, mostly what they want from people involved in the movement is a narrative of what happened. What happened then, and what happened then. What they don't, what they're less enthusiastic about is getting at the thinking of movement people. So when you read these books, you don't really know. Why did Stokely Carmichael shout out Black Power anyway in 1966? What did bring Bob Moses? back to Mississippi in 1961. What's the thinking going on? Ideas don't appear out of nowhere. Somebody's thinking about something. And since I was involved in the movement, I know that there was reasons for everything that we did. So I'm trying to tackle that as well. I'm reading, and this is a very old problem. Let me read you something. Just bear with me for a minute because I think it's important. <clears throat> I can find it. I'm in the wrong section. There we go. In his 1855 autobiography, Frederick Douglass, in his autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, Frederick Douglass, and I, 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 I had read it before, and then I was actually looking for some other quote. Frederick Douglass had stumbled on this passage. Uh, Frederick Douglass complained that William Lloyd Garrison and other influential white abolitionists thought that his intellectual growth weakened their cause. They only wanted him to, quote, narrate wrongs among Douglass. 
Uh, although, after escaping from slavery, quote, I was now reading and thinking. However, if he did not have, quote, the plantation manner of speech, John A. Collins, general agent of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, once counseled Douglas, quote, people won't ever believe you was a slave. Tis not best that you appear to learn. The abolitionist went on to tell Douglas with no small degree of arrogance, quote, give us the facts, we will take care of the philosophy. <laughs> that problem is still with us. <laughs> and it's why I get after movement people to write books, <laughs> you know, with limited success. Everybody seems to have an excuse. I'm working on it, though. Uh, but this problem of, of the invisibility of the thoughts of people, you know, undermines understanding of what happened in the 1960s. And people's thoughts are not all the same, so how Leslie McLemore thinks or Harry Tensman thinks and I think might be very, very different, but it's important to have in the mix the thinking of people. This is one of the great failures of, of the university. You see in lots of different ways. You know, going to political science departments, you see virtually no discussion of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, despite its <coughs> enormous impact uh, on the shape, uh, political shape of the country. Now, since this is 19, 2014, and we're at the 50th anniversary of, of uh, the Freedom Summer in Mississippi, uh, while I'm talking about this, I, I want to cite uh, Stoughton Lynn, who, who was an attorney and activist, a historian by profession, and excuse me, who was the coordinator of the Freedom School program during the 1964 summer project. Um, something he sent me uh, that he's working on on a, on a book. Um, he says uh, that he thinks what is needed is what he calls Gorilla history. <laughs> and here's how he explained it to me in an email. In the practice of guerrilla history, the insights of non-academic protagonists are considered to be potentially as valuable as those of the historian. Thus, guerrilla history is not a process wherein the poor and oppressed provide poignant facts and a radical academic interprets them. Historical agent and professor of history are understood to be co-workers, together mapping out the terrain traveled and the possibility of openings in the mountain ridges ahead. That's Stoughton's view of, of history that I'm very much in agreement with, as you probably have guessed. <laughs> I want to, because uh, I'd like to leave a lot of time for questions, to say one more thing about this year, 2014. This, as important as the Mississippi Freedom Summer was, this is also an anniversary year for a range of things. You know, this is the year the Deacons for Defense and Justice were formed in Jonesboro, Louisiana. This is the year in Louisiana where CORE launched its Freedom Summer. This is the year when the black community of Tuscaloosa Alabama broke down segregation with amazing speed in that Ku Klux Klan city. This is the year of the St. Augustine protest. All this 50 years ago when I say this is the year, 1964. This is the year of the St. Augustine protests uh, that really probably gave the final nudge to passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Also, I should say, where Andy Young got brutally beaten in the first and only beaten he, beating he ever received uh, as a civil rights uh, uh, protester. This is the year of great turmoil in Cambridge, uh, uh, Maryland, and Gloria Richardson, who, who the head of the White Citizens Council complained of, of Gloria that we can't deal with her and we can't deal without her. Uh, it is also the year that General Nelson uh, in Cambridge, Maryland, said of Gloria Richardson, uh, she, 
She's the only true leader in Cambridge. She's the Lady General of Cambridge's movement. So, I, one of the things that's often absent in discussion of history is how things are connected. You know, all of these things that we would celebrate or commemorate or analyze at a 50th, I mean, are connected. You can't really separate what happened in Louisiana in the summer of 64 and what happened in uh, Mississippi. And, and sometimes it gets very personal. But Dave Dennis, who was the Corps director here in the state of Mississippi at that time, uh, were here. He would talk about the fact that Corps was given two cars for its work in the South. One was given to the Louisiana people, the Corps, and the other was given to him for use uh, work in Mississippi, and he loaned it to Mickey Schwerner and James Cheney for use uh, in Neshoba County, and that's the car they were in when they were murdered. So there are connections both negatively and positively in all of these events. So, so although we're here in Mississippi and, and, and obviously there's a lot of Memory. Let's not forget that, that events, places, and people are connected all across the South. We have to think about the struggle that unfolded all across the South as much as we think about the struggle that unfolded uh, here in uh, Mississippi. And I, I said, I think, about enough of what I want to say. Uh, like most writers, I'd rather look at my screen and keyboard <laughs> than at an audience. So, so it seems appropriate at this point to take uh, questions and comments. That's all right. That's, that's great. So, we want to go to questions and answers. Uh, let me say, I, I, I uh, since you started late, Keith is on the program here brought greetings and, and he will say something uh, in the close of March because there's a, another activity tomorrow. Uh, so I wanted to, wanted to get us started and then let him do that at the end to wrap up. Uh, so he, he uh, will have some words to say about uh, what is going to happen tomorrow and so forth uh, in this, this uh, series. So questions, answers, I mean questions, comments, what have you? Uh, Charlie, let, let me start off with the, with the softball here. Uh, you mentioned Aaron Henry uh, <coughs> Clark's there. Uh, you identify obviously several important sites uh, in your book. Um, one of the troubling aspects of what we're witnessing now is the, uh, the banishing nature of some of these historic civil rights places. Aaron Henry worked in Clarksdale. Uh, he was a member of Haven United Methodist Church where he grew up, family, etc. That church played a major role in the civil rights movement in Clarksdale. But right across the street from the church, of course, was Doc Henry's drugstore, the 4th Street drugstore, which is now just a country slab. Uh, the NAACP office, which was just due west of the Haven United Methodist Church, uh, was also in, in later the headquarters of Aaron Henry's run for the Mississippi House of Representatives. It is now a slab. Uh, Page Street, where he lived, 631 Page Street in Clarksdale, the house that was bombed and where he lived, where he raised his family, is now just a slab. I'm saying a slab, I mean country slab, okay? Uh, what is your thinking in terms of trying to help preserve some of these places so they will serve as teaching tools and reminders for young people who don't know this history? And, and who so often are not, are not taught to this issue? Well, I, I think um, uh, communities will have to organize to save and preserve these places. I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic about the willingness of state and local government to do this. There may, there may be ways, but people who live in Mississippi who know this better than me, there may be ways to pressure state and local government to preserve these places. And, and I see it everywhere. 
not just in Mississippi. I mean, while we're talking about that, Amzie Moore's house is all boarded up and weed grown. You know, the people in Meridian, Mississippi, are fighting to preserve <coughs> uh, the COFO office uh, there and in other parts of the South. I don't know enough to be able to comment on what informs or misinforms uh, state and local government in their decision making about what to preserve and what not to preserve. Some places get preserved and some places get ignored. I'm not, I'm not sure in a way that I would feel competent or comfortable commenting to you about it. Uh, given my background as a Smith Field Secretary, my instinct is to say, you know, you have to organize in these communities to protect some of these places. And, and that's a problem of education because I was with McLaurin and I went to, uh, we were in Cleveland together uh, last year and bring some teachers uh, from, to, to look uh, at sites. And, and we got to Amzie's house. And the teachers were quite distressed. It was very interesting because I had been talking about Amzie so much and, 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 and saying we will be going by his house. When they got there to see it all, these were teachers from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. When we got there to see it all weed grown with boards against the window, was quite distressing to them. They, they asked me pretty much the question you asked just now, Les. Uh, and the people next door didn't know who Amzie Moore was, even though, uh, what's the school in Cleveland? Um, Delta State. Delta State. No, the Delta State. Yeah, yeah. Delta State. Yeah, they, they, they really financed the placing of a marker there. And it might be possible to continue a conversation with them about maintenance of the place. I don't know, you know, is it quite noticeable uh, in Clarksdale? I mean, all of the sites of, of uh, Doc Henry's work, his church, his home, you know, the NACP office, are all in just awful disrepair, if it, you know. Uh, and I don't have good ideas beyond my vague statement of, um, you know, you have to organize in communities to preserve this. I don't have good ideas past that, quite frankly. Yes? Uh, well, I want to say I appreciate you for uh, breaking out the point, the story about the young people not knowing enough about family and um, maybe error. But I feel like that gap is wider. Uh, a lot of people my age, 26, don't, are not well educated on those figures as well. Um, and I try to let them know that 50 years wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> but I, I feel like um, our generation has um, some kind of complacency. We, can, we have the ability to go anywhere we want to go. We have access to whatever we want, unlike during those times of the Civil Rights Movement, you know, we didn't have those privileges. But we are being attacked in different ways. So how can we maybe um, stop maybe being so pro, uh, programmatic and you know, just celebrating and talking about the civil rights movement, but uh, try to continue it and get the fire burning in us, I guess. It's well, th this is a problem of education at two levels. I mean, in some respects you're luckier here in Mississippi than in many other places because you have the veterans group here in Mississippi. You have an organized group of Mississippi veterans and you have, you know, based on tools, Campus. So you, you, you have the ability, if you want to organize it, to create, you know, uh, regular and systematic contact with people who shape this movement here in Mississippi. That's not true in all parts of the South. Uh, but uh, you have that 
in uh, here in Jackson. Well, no, here in here in the state. There's a fight that has to be made, and it's a huge fight because it's the it's the it's part of the fight for education, public education. You know, and that's the one arena that a we never seriously tackled as organizers. The Freedom Schools, notwithstanding, during the summer of 1964, the whole question of pop, pop, the whole question of quality public education in public <coughs> schools remains unresolved. You know, the country says it wants quality public education, but I don't see many signs that it's really willing to struggle for that. It's an organizing job. You may have to, it may require exactly what was required uh, around voter registration, you know, where, where they said, the people denying black people the right to vote said, well, black people don't want to vote. And furthermore, they're not able to vote, meaning they're not intelligent enough to vote. And that didn't get turned around until black people began to make a demand for the right to vote. And if you go, and it's one of the things I learned working on the book with Bob Moses, if you go to these, a lot of these schools and talk to administrators, school systems, they say something similar. They say, these kids don't want to learn. And they say, these kids can't learn. Look at them. Uh, and I think that gets turned around when, when the students start to make it a band. And that's part of the answer for, for, for informing the consciousness in students about what the movement was in, in the 1960s, what it is today, because it's a continuing struggle. The movement didn't solve every single issue, confronting either black people or society in uh, General, you know, once once the students with the algebra project in Baltimore, Maryland, this was several years ago, tried to place the uh, superintendent of schools in Baltimore under citizen's arrest for not doing his job. And I told him, I said, I really kind of like that. I can relate to, the, <laughs> to, to, the, to that kind of action, that kind of inter and actually, you know, in, in part of the there's a lot more student activism that I think people realize. I, I don't subscribe to this notion that oh, we had it all figured out in the 1960s because things were so clear and all we had to do was organize and protest. I mean, what's wrong in society or in their environments is as clear to students today as it was clear to us uh, in the 1960s. And some students uh, indeed have become activists. I also want to say, I didn't mean to go into This is not unique to the United States. Go to South Africa, you know, where, where Nelson Mandela is held up here as the great icon of, of the South African liberation movement. But very little, among your age group and younger, is known about the decades of struggle and organizing that took place <coughs> in South Africa. Names that are important to those who follow it. Walter Sassoulo or Lillian Goy, you know, don't exist really in the historical consciousness of a lot of South Africans. Uh, you know, and I've been in a lot of countries, you know, that, you know, have become independent through liberation movements, protests of various kinds, and, and very little of it for reasons I don't quite understand trickles down to future to future generations. So you talk to high school students in, in these places, and they know as much about their movement in Zimbabwe or South Africa or Ghana or some places. Students here in the United States know about the movement uh, uh, in the in the United States. So it's a it's a huge problem. Uh, Insofar as the United States is concerned, if you're talking about awareness on a broad level, I think you have to fight for it in the public schools. Yes? You said something that was so interesting to me. I hadn't thought about it this way. And I'm not sure how to ask my question, so give me a chance to ask Take it two ways. 
you said that one of the things that made the movement possible was that the older generation kind of handed it over to the younger generation, which makes me think about today where the older generation has less respect for and belief in the younger generation's capacity to do something like that or something important. So my first half of the question is kind of what has happened to that or how was it so unique that at that time they trusted them enough to you know, take care of the hard groundwork they have laid? Or the sort of flip side of it is what has happened to young people that they don't sort of want to take over something and create a movement? I agree with you that there are people who are doing things. I don't think, I don't think young people are operating at the level of movement. I don't think there's enough people responding politically and actively to, con you know, to, to count as movement. What has happened to prevent that kind of connection, do you think? Well, one, I, I didn't mean to get to understand. I don't feel that older people handed over the movement to younger people. Oh, I, I think I said there was convergence of young people with older people. So when Amzie Moore embraces us, uh, you know, he's not handing over the movement, trust me, <laughs> to us, us 19 and 20 and 20 year olds. Amzie wanted to use the student energy that he saw in the sit-in movement for things that he thought were important. And number one on his list of things that were important was voter registration. And he persuaded Bob Moses, who had not been thinking about this at all when he met him, that this was important. Bob says he had been, Bob went to school in the 1950s. Bob said, I've been taught in school all through my school years about the Iron Curtain and the denial of the right to vote behind the Iron Curtain. And it wasn't until Amzie Moore sat him down that he realized that there was denial of the right to vote behind the Cotton Curtain. Uh, so this Convergence, Ella Baker, same thing. Ella Baker, the great lady of 20th century social change, the one who really, the single most important person in terms of, of, of the creation of SNCC, certainly, and, and also of Martin Luther King's SCLC, and also in terms of the development of NACP branches across the South in the 1940s. Miss Baker, and she was always Miss Baker to us, she was 57 years old when we met her, uh, recognized that same student energy that Amzi recognized and steered us into grassroots community organizing from the bottom up. Up until Miss Baker, the idea of the students, people like myself, Stokely, and all of us, was direct action protests, sit-ins, and picket lines. Ms. Baker said, you have to organize. Not only do you have to organize, you have to organize from the bottom up, not the top down. Strong people don't need strong leaders, she said. So my first point in reaction to your comment is, I think, I agree with Julian Bach. Uh, you know, Julian said it once, and, and, I, Julian once wanted to be a comedian. Uh, Julian, Julian said once, joking, he said, what is this handover leadership stuff? You want to be a leader? Snatch it. Uh, uh, I kind of agree with that comment by Julian, too. Uh, so there's that. Uh, I think. Uh, Community organizing, it. you're right. I don't, people forget that there wasn't, when the synods erupted, even with the formation of SNCC, and even with the expansion of CORE, there really wasn't that much of a movement. I went to Howard University. I was a part of a nonviolent action group. Howard had then maybe 6,000 students. Five, six thousand students. If you're talking about membership 
in the non-violent action group, maybe, and just maybe, there were 25 members. Uh, for lots of reasons. So, so there wasn't, there were a lot of spontaneous student uprisings in, in the 1960s, but it took a while for it to shape itself in a, into anything resembling a movement. And I think the same thing is true today. I, I was following the Occupy Wall Street people. I used to get in discussions with them. At, in Providence, where I sometimes teach. And my, I had one question for them all the time that they stumbled on. I said, well, none of you people knock on my door. Talk to me about your movement. Try to persuade me to become involved in your movement. I said, I live in the inner city of Jacksonville, Florida. I said, nobody's come to the church next door to my house to talk about what you want, make your case to people who are going to be skeptical. Just the way they were skeptical of us when we showed up in these communities, even when we were introduced to these communities. When, when, when McLaurin and I went to Woolville in 1962, Amzi Moore brought us there, head of the NACP in neighboring Bolivar County, and he did not place us at the head of a protest march or sit in. Hell, the only place you could sit in and move in those days was the gas station restaurant, toilet. Uh, but he brought us to Mount Galilee Missionary Baptist Church and introduced us to the conversation, to the congregation. And we had to explain to that congregation why we were in town, knowing full well that a lot of people in that town, black people, were going to be scared that we were there. And a lot of black people in that town were not going to say, oh, good, we've been waiting for you. Let's all go to the county courthouse and get registered to vote. <laughs> you have to work to build a movement. And the way you work to build a movement, in my view, is you embed yourself in communities and begin to talk to communities, begin to identify people who join you in any particular effort. Or what you really do if you're organizing is identify what the local consensus is and then figure out how you can work with that consensus. Activists today haven't quite figured that out yet. And, and, and this is because we, that is me and other movement people, haven't done a very good job at explaining the organizing tradition that belongs to the movement as much as freedom rides and sit-ins. So they, they have, and yes, it's a different society in terms of the dynamic and the relationship of people, but I think the larger problem is that we haven't done a good job in passing on this tradition. So I don't think you can get a movement independent of that. You can get occasional protests, as you saw with the Occupy Wall Street groups. And we certainly see protests. You have the Moral Mondays group, which I'm hopeful will begin to, Moral Mondays in North Carolina, which has been engaged in acts of protest and civil disobedience over the state legislature's attempts to restrict voting rights and to cut back on social services. Or you have the Dream Defenders in, in uh, in uh, Florida, sat in uh, um, in the governor's office for 31 days protesting the Stand Your Ground law. So you have activism. And I would argue you have more activism today than you had in the 1960s, certainly in the early 1960s. What you don't have is the organizing effort in the community to translate the activism in the things that are important in people's lives, community lives, so you don't get a movement yet. This, this is why we need to teach the movement so that young activists can see this. Her hand was up first, and then I'll ask you. Yeah. There are several things in the words that <coughs> I um, Just briefly, I, um, 
I teach political science at the Community College up in Minnesota, and I also teach a summer class on the movement here, which I started teaching because, you know, in 2005, when Rosa Parks passed away, I had students, black students, who didn't know who she was. <laughs> you know, and even the simplest, most superficial narrative of the movement, you think that you know who Rosa Parks was. So, so I've been bringing students to the South traveling to the South, both studying the movement, but also working with them to, to make those connections, you know, between, you know, the struggles of the past and their own struggles now, which I think is a really important thing to do. So the two things that really jumped out at me when you were talking was, was the piece about the convergence, you know, intergenerational convergence. And, and, you know, as I'm working with students now around educational justice issues, my college, has actually been in the news quite a bit. I teach at Minneapolis Community Technical College, and it's a big controversy, national news around the teacher who was reprimanded around uh, teaching uh, about structural racism. Yeah. You know, and, um, and uh, again, just all sorts of issues about quality of education, retention rates, et cetera, et cetera. But what, what has been really challenging and hard to find and create what I see is lacking, you know, are those intergenerational spaces and those of us who are who are working with the younger students, you know, to, to, to do this and trying to figure out where to start. Because at least up north, the churches aren't those anymore, mm -hmm. to be honest. You know, so um, so that's one challenge that's been really big. And secondly, another challenge is around the role of nonprofit organizations, which are really, really dominant in the Twin Cities as well, and, um, and I think thinking about generational transition of power, you have a lot of really entrenched folks at the heads of these organizations, supposed to bring about change, who, again, have a lot of stake in keeping things the way they are, just to be frank. Um, then, um, the other piece that really jumped out at me that I thought was really powerful too was around the storytelling piece. You know, and, um, you know, because I think often the, the narratives that you see in the history books, you know, makes you all into to myth, mythological figures, you know, and I think it's so important for young people who are trying to find their, their, their voice and their own power, you know, to, to, to see that you're human, right? And, and they were trying to, you didn't know what the heck you were doing, but you, you just did it and figured it out as you went along, you know, so I think it's so powerful, you know, you know, when I bring my students and they hear people like you talk about that process, you know, and, and there's that light bulb moment, okay, you, you, you learn it by, by doing it. You know, so, so thank you for that piece too, because I, I think- Yeah, what I tell my students all the time, the bottom line question in the movement, from sit-ins to voter registration efforts to Mississippi Freedom Drive is, is a simple question. That's what are you gonna do? Right. <laughs> and you know <laughs> that was the bottom line question. And a lot and most of the time you had to figure out what it was uh, you were gonna do. And sometimes <laughs> you did the wrong thing. <laughs> yes. I found all kinds of little you know, and I'm trying to I'm trying to be a little bit coherent. I'll I'll start with what you just said. What are you going to do? What are you going to do about what? And you talk about movement. Movement for what? To go where? Um, what? Here, I, I'm a Mississippi born person. I wasn't raised here, but I was raised by Mississippi people. And I, I don't get into all the names of that. I'm sorry. But um, we, when we talk about people like my family, Hamer, and some of the other people, um, we, those who were, let's say, in the so-called movement, because they haven't heard of freedom, freedom movement people, even though I know of some freedom movement people, and I don't say, well, what did you guys really do? Okay. What, 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 what did you do uh, socially, and what did you do to cause whatever you're trying to do to stop? Um, even right here in Mississippi. Many people here in Mississippi don't know anything about mom the body in Mississippi. Many people. Okay. And I often, often say that non binding people or whatever started did more with less than we are doing. They did more with less, we were less with more. Now, I live in D.C. from 75 to 2001. B. 
before Carter started putting people in all these high positions, before Mary Berry put people in high positions. What I saw, and I'm going to use this term, you can take it if you want to, but please give me credit. <laughs> what I saw happening with black folk is what I call, not did you say integration? No, I say VIPization. <laughs> they started VIP movements. I agree. Okay? Uh, there was, <laughs> they started VIP movements. They started getting these different positions. And they, we stopped associating with folk because we had, you know, we didn't have to protest to go to a restaurant. You didn't have to protest on the stores like uh, in D.C. Garfinkel's. They have to go, you know, to the back or whatever in D.C. And, and I, when I say this accusation, I remember going to the Book T. Washington Hilton, and now they used to call it in D.C. Um, and, and I'm the son of the Urban League. I used to do things work with the Urban League. And one, and I'm not going to mention person's name, but you probably know her because she lives in D.C. There was a conference going on, and this young lady was a She put a big old sign on the door, and she had a she had a circle in the center, and she had VIP written there, which meant all the Negroes, colored, black, African Americans, who were important, were to put their names there. All the rest of us were to put our names outside. All right, and I saw, I witnessed that. I witnessed the separation. You know, and then we talk about voting. Let's say you guys are trying to get the vote. Folks are asking now, vote for what? Because when black folks, and I'm not saying for the white folks, we don't like to, you know, I go to lunch now, so I'm not hanging my lunch out, right? So, <laughs> when you have, when you have, uh, you see me lose my heart to the country, you should have done it to me. <laughs> that you may lose my heart to the thought, because like, I get, oh God, I forgot what I was going to say, but it had to do with us as black folk not, not doing what we were supposed to do for the young folks. I, I say to my students, how did we get to where we weren't allowed to read, but now you don't want to read? Okay? You couldn't read, and you don't want to read. This is what we're trying to get you to read. And are we on different ideologies where, uh, as someone was saying, you know, those who got in charge, they want to let go of the charge. But what we were supposed to do was go out and start our own thing, and, 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 you know, whatever it is we want to do. And I think we didn't do that. Um, we really need, as far as movement is concerned, we need to have a movement where we sit down and discuss how we messed up. How Me. movement folk messed up. Yep. How we got a generation that, you know, are dropping out of college, don't want to read the material. How you don't talk about that? That would be worthwhile. I'll tell you why. I, let, me, let me go back. You said a lot, so I have to, I have to take different pieces of it. 1966, the White House had a conference called to secure these rights. It brought all the organizations. SNCC didn't go. Uh, but, there was a picket line in front of the conference. It was being held, might have been the Sheridan Hotel in D.C. And the picketers carried signs that read, Save us from our Negro leaders. <laughs> <laughs> this strand, this kind of tension has existed I, I, all the way back to the beginnings of black history in the United States. It's not unique to the 20th century or the mid 20th century. I mean, whether you look at the clashes, and I mean the ideological clashes between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, or between Marcus Garvey and Du Bois, or between Monroe Trotter and Du Bois, uh, I mean, Walter White and Du Bois. <laughs> Walter uh, Du Bois, in the city, when you get to be 90 something, I mean, you just did everything. <laughs> so these kinds of tensions, uh, you know, and strains have existed throughout black history, and they exist in other parts of the world where there's a political <coughs> struggle and liberation. So that's one thing in response. You ask, what are you going to do? What, you, what you're going to do depends on where you are in time and place. For instance, when the sit-ins erupted on February the 1st, 1960, in Greensboro, and they spread across the South, and particularly the Nashville students, the Atlanta students, and the uh, Orangeburg, South Carolina students were on television. I was in the 12th grade when the sit-ins happened. If you were black and in high school and planning to go to college, as I was, or at least my parents were, uh, the odds were overwhelming you were going to be going to a historically black college or university. You know, there were a handful of black.
blacks in places like Harvard and Brown and Columbia and whatnot, City College. But by and large, you were going to be going to a historically black college and university, which meant, with one or two exceptions, Lincoln and Wilberforce in Ohio, Lincoln and Pennsylvania, you'd be going to school in the South. So what's coming across to me on the television screen watching, say, Diane Nash or Julian Bond or Chuck McDoo and protest leaders is, A, they're about my age. You're going to be where they are in another year. What are you going to do confronted with this kind of thing? Segregation, denial of service in public facilities. So that's one. But that's just at that moment. Then I get confronted with all these Mississippians who decide to kidnap me because they're getting ready to start a voter registration campaign up in the Delta. This is 1962. I've left from 1960. What are you going to do when you get to school, Charlie? And somebody refuses to serve you in a restaurant. 1962, I step off the bus in Jackson, Mississippi here, and I meet Lawrence Guiot, Jesse Harris, Dory Ladner, who essentially kidnapped me in a political sense. And instead of why going where I intended to go, which was Houston, Texas, I wind up in Sunflower County, <laughs> Mississippi. What's happening? These students are telling me what they're getting ready to do up in the Delta around voter registration. They're looking at me and say, so what are you going to do? Are you just going to chatter about civil rights in Texas? Or are you going to come up here with us? And I wind up going up there with Charles McLaurin. That's at that particular moment. What are you going to do? And I think movement people get confronted with these kind of choices all through their movement lives. And the answer to the question depends on their situation. Hollis Watkins tells this story. He was staying with a farmer and his wife, and, um, and everybody knows Hollis, I assume. Hollis is one of the first of the students from Mississippi to become full-time involved with the move, head of Southern Echo now here, and also chair of the Veterans Union. So Hollis tells this story, he told me this story once. He was, this is in 63, I think. He stayed with a farmer and his wife uh, up in Holmes County, Mississippi. And he's up there for a couple of days, and he realizes that because he is there, the farmer and his wife, in addition to farming all day, are taking turns guarding the house and Hollis with guns all night, effectively exhausting themselves. Often the first question I had to deal with is, what was I going to do? These people are, are exhausting themselves because of me. He said, what I saw, I naturally said, well, what did you decide to do? <laughs> and he said, I told them I'd take a turn guarding the house. Uh, which he did. And so again, that related to that particular situation. He felt he had bore some responsibility for these people exhausting themselves, the Howards and had to step in and volunteer to relieve them by taking a shift, guarding the house. So I think every movement person, if you dig at them and their experience, you'll find all along their movement life, them uh, making, and sometimes they weren't easy decisions to make about what they're going to do. Uh, and here I'm talking about movement people. When I say the, the, the basic question is what are you going to do, I'm not talking about the national headquarters of SNCC or the national headquarters of the NACP or the national headquarters of the Corps or the national headquarters of SCLC. I'm talking about the group of people who are in wherever, Holmes County, Avid County, Pike County, Madison County, who day to day have to make decisions 
that affect not only themselves, but other people's lives. And have to make them at two levels. One is, is almost a personal decision. Uh, uh, and the other is a, is a more movement decision. And say, well, if we do this, what will be the effect? Uh, you know, the, the, it's, since we're in the 50th of, of of uh, the 1964 Summer Project, Bob Moses proposed that project. Uh, and I know why he proposed it, the frustration with all the violence in the state and the like, and he felt that unless you bring the country's children down here, the country will not pay attention to Mississippi. And by the country's children, he meant white students. A lot of us working in the state, not as one of them, were opposed to it. We knew what Bob wanted to do and why he wanted to do it. We were opposed to it. So <clears throat> I won't take you through all the debates and arguments and all of this and the back and forth that eventually led to, to the summer project of 1964. But this is more than personal. This is organizational, political. But it's still the same question. We were faced in Mississippi with just a steady increase in violence and in killing and reprisals and all of this. So we had to struggle. With, and we were, nobody was paying attention to us. Nobody in the federal government. And, and the way local uh, government, county government, town governments paid attention to us was by reinforcing the Klan or some group like that. So we were faced with this large political question. What are we going to do? Can we do what we're doing in the face of this steady increase in violence? And Bob thought, no, not unless we make the country pay attention to us. And the way you make the country pay attention to us is bring the country's children down here to Mississippi. Very concrete approach. But it was still, you know, that's different than if I'm walking up to the county courthouse with some lady and get jumped by some white guy or some group of white guys, you know. That's different than Hollis Watkins deciding to take a ship guarding the house in, uh, in Holmes County, Mississippi. But all along, the whole movement experience is constantly, and I would argue creatively, addressing this basic question. You're up against this, this whole system of racism and white supremacy and denial. Mm -hmm. There's only one question, if you're serious, and that's why I think we got support from these grown-up Mississippians, because they had wrestled with this question before we were born. It's still the same question. What are you going to do? And it's still the question with us today. <laughs> and it's still the question. And you can bite off any piece of the problem that you want, because I don't think any organization or individual can take on the whole problem. But it still boils down to this question. Either you're going to do something, or as Guy accused me, or you're going to go off somewhere and chatter <laughs> about what the problem is. And you're confronted with that choice. That same choice I had to make when I saw the sit-in students on television. Well, Charlie, what are you going to do when you walk into a Woolworths and want to get a Coke and they say no? You know, it's always. Well, that doesn't answer, you know, you, you put a lot of stuff on it. There needs to be, you also raise, and really what you're raising are the class tensions within the black community. You know, Ms. Henry used to call the NACP the National Association for Certain People. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so that's been with us, that's been with us too. Uh, 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 you know, that's not unique to the 1960s. It's not unique to whatever tensions existed in, among civil rights organizations been with us uh, right, and certainly with us today. One problem, and, and then I will stop, uh, is of course 
the black community, quote, uh, in some ways, and I'm still thinking this true through, and if I ever finish thinking it through, I will write about it. The black community is less cohesive today. I mean, because you can today, if you're black, you can do things my parents couldn't do. You can live in neighborhoods my parents couldn't live in. You know, you can send your kids to school. If you got money, you can send your kids to the finest private schools, or you can hire the best tutors. So, there's, you know, growing up, as I did, in 1950s America, late 1940s and late 1950s, everybody from the numbers runners <laughs> To, 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 to the doctors were in the neighborhood. And, uh, and there were conversations because everybody shared the same problem of racism and discrimination. So there were, cons there were conversations that cut through uh, the class differences. Uh, you know, if, if you're a doctor driving up Route 40, it's an old road that still exists, but was the main road to New York in the 1950s and 60s. Didn't matter whether you were a doctor or a junkie. <laughs> if you walked into those restaurants on that highway, they weren't going to serve you. Uh, and it started to cause problems. Interesting, it's an interesting story about, which I'm not going to tell about, the kind of problems that caused for the Kennedy administration as African nations became independent and used to drive between Washington in New York and what happened to those African um, diplomats. So, but we do have this problem, it's a class problem in my view, of, of, of categories, you know, of, of black people. You know, I, in my book, and I'm not going to burden you with that section of the book either, I argue in an, in an afterword that the discussion of nonviolence and the legacy of nonviolence in the civil rights movement may be more relevant today than it was in the 1960s because if you're not living in the privileged communities, but you're living in a public housing project and you're living in working class uh, communities, you've got a real problem in many instances of people of color killing people of color. And that the discussion of non, it may be worthwhile if you want to tackle this, raising the question of nonviolence in these communities, and how would you do that? You know, because the movement was never about nonviolence, the movement was about organizing. The mission of the movement of the 60s was organizing for voter registration or organizing for desegregation was not about values. And it strikes me as interesting that inarguably, unarguably, and, and clearly, nonviolent direct action effected change in this country. So why haven't the values of nonviolence carried over into the black uh, community? Who, who, you know, where are our leaders when it comes to tackling now, not so much white supremacy, although that's still a problem, but tackling the problems we see every day in inner city neighborhoods. You know, everybody rushes down to denounce, uh, what's his name, who killed Trayvon Martin. And it was, when I saw, I lived in Florida, so I, I saw Sharpton, all those guys coming down there saying, well, what do they have to say about Chicago? <laughs> you know, what do they have to say about these places where bodies are piling up? You know, that's an organizing mission. And most of our leadership does not come from communities affected by these problems. They may be black, but they don't come from communities affected by these problems. They don't, they're not the equivalent of Fannie Lou Hamer, who's coming off the plantation, or E.W. Steptoe, a small farmer, 
they come. Well, that may be my next book. Let me read that. Of course, we're back. Well, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I wanted to thank you for coming out and, you know, tell, tell your story about how you were involved with the movement and et cetera. And I also wanted to ask you about, um, you know, here in Jackson, I don't know if you've been keeping up with politics here, but we just had one of the most dynamic mayoral elections. You know, that I've seen, probably since Frank Wilson, I'll say that. Were you surprised that you opened the number one? Uh, was I surprised? Um, I can't really say surprised that he was one, but I will say that it did ignite a big debate across the city. I, I will say I had more conversations about politics during that election than I've ever had with just kids everywhere. And I want to ask you, you know, I read an article, and the title was, you know, Jackson has, Jackson, Mississippi, has elected the most radical politician in the United States. And in light of that statement, um, what significance does the election of Sherwood Mahomes, you know, lay on you in light of just movement history and in light of strategy, movement strategy? Because the old strategy was always, you know, fight the system and et cetera. But now we have a guy that's, you know, in the center of the system, to sort of, sort of speak. He's not the governor. But he kind of in my I understand exactly yeah. what you're saying. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly distant, you know, from the currents of, of uh, Jackson uh, politics. You know, I remember, you know, Chokwe came down as leader of the Republic of New Africa, and then they wanted to carve out, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, a, a land, you know, for a separate state. I don't know. I've only, I have not had any conversations with this. I don't know how he relates his current position as mayor, and very much, as you point out, at the center, certainly of the political establishment uh, here in, in uh, Jackson, with his earlier role as really a separatist, uh, as head of the uh, Republic of New Africa. Does he see that as? His earlier life in contradiction with his later. I'm old enough to know though that people evolve, people change, people learn from. I mean, I'm certainly not the 19-year-old who came to Mississippi in 1962. I'll be 71 on the 50th anniversary of the summer project. <laughs> so I, I don't. In some ways, I don't have a good answer for you uh, uh, because you, it's a question to put to. Chokwe Lumumba, I don't know if he's the most radical mayor or politician. I steer clear of those kinds of labels in defining uh, political figures especially and people in general. I find that people are radical about one thing and conservative about another thing is what I really uh, found out. So I don't know, uh, you know, if he's the most radical politician. Uh, I mean, in some respects, time will tell that story. Let's see if he does something radical. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it's like asking, you know, about how radical is Barack Obama? You know, is he less radical now that he's president than he was as a law student? <laughs> you know, I just kind of duck those questions. I, well, though, that is a question I leave to scholars. Well, I, I, don't I, don't wanna, things. I don't want to make it seem like I was trying to frame the question and ask whether he, you think he's radical or not. But more or less, whether activists around the city should feel, I don't know, should they feel more comfortable to embrace that role that he's in? You know, should they feel more comfortable to... Well, well I would think that activists in the city have discussed and more or less resolved this, but he's not the first black mayor, he's the third black mayor of well, activists. Right? So one it's question is... Four black huh? It's That's actually the four black men. Four? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this, this question, which, which is, is, is an important question, I think, uh, uh, to what degree do you want to embrace black people who've made their way into the higher reaches of the establishment seems to be a worthwhile discussion. And I, I imagine that given Jackson's recent history, that discussion has at least started. I would not focus that discussion on Chokwe Lumumba, you know. Uh, if you want
you want to have a discussion about Chokwe and Lumumba, the thing to focus on is what, he, what is he doing? What are his policies? Do you think he's making things better or not? I'm not opposed to black people being in elected offices, even black people I disagree with. <laughs> I'm just not opposed to that. It just seems to be the normal course of the progress here. Is it reflects the opening up of the site. And I also am realistic enough to know that what you have to do to get into the higher reaches of politics might make you a little different than you were at 19. <laughs> And that's not racial either. That's as true for as true for all politicians, you know, not, not just black politicians. You know, the system makes demands on you once you decide to be president, or once you decide to be mayor. You know, the system will take its toll, make its demands on who you're supposed to be. Or don't be. Other questions or something? Well, if not, this has been great. It's been quite a dialogue. <laughs>